Kia ora, everybody. So, um, <laughs> why thank you. So, um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, I hope everyone gets a seat if there's more stragglers coming in. Um, my name is Callum McRae. I am with the uh, School of Biological Sciences and I am here to talk to you about biological sex and what that really means because um, there's a lot of people who have misconceptions and all sorts of wild ideas about what it really means. So this, um, this lecture is going to discuss a few things. It's going to discuss genitals, it's going to discuss pregnancy, miscarriage, puberty, um, I'm going to use some big words. Um, so this is this is a, a science lecture. So there are going to be big words and maybe some tricky concepts. If I'm going too fast, tell me. Um, yeah, and just letting you know beforehand, just in case any of these topics do make you uncomfortable. So um, another thing that I just want to clear up before we start is that. Um, sex is not equivalent to gender, gender being the psychosocial um, idea of one's identity as um, a masculine or a feminine identity or both neither, um, whatever that is. We don't have a good scientific description for gender um, and so a lot of what I'm going to be discussing is about the physical bodies of people rather than their gender identities, um, yeah, we don't know anything about gender in science, really. We haven't found any biological causes of gender, really. Um, people think they have, but we don't know. We really don't know. Um, and so you're like, well, but why... Why does this matter? Can't we just look up what sex means in a dictionary? And so here I've got the Oxford English Dictionary definition. It says that it's either of the two main categories, male and female, um, into which humans and most other living things are divided on the basis of their reproductive function. Now that, that doesn't actually tell us anything. What does a male look like? What does a female look like? That doesn't tell us. Um, in much the same way that the definition of a dog doesn't tell you that they are animals that like to fetch sticks. Um, this doesn't tell you what male or female actually means. It just... So this is not good enough. And so then we need to ask, how do biologists define sex? And the answer is, there, are, there is not actually a consistent definition. Um, there's sort of an assumption um, that we all know what is meant by male and female um, and that all biologists and all doctors and all medical researchers know what male and female means um, and that's not, but there isn't actually a definition and of course the, the categories of male and female are not, they're not clear cut. Um, there, are, there are definitely lots of people with physiologies that fit in between these two definitions and maybe fit outside the two definitions as well. Um, but how we do generally think of sex in biology and in medicine is we class it by the, the, um, the five Gs. Genes, gonads, gametes, genitals, and secondary sexual characteristics. The G is silent and also usually invisible. <laughs> Quick question. Quick question. Um, gonads. What is the definition of gonads? You are going to find out what the definition of gonads is. Okay, go. I'm going to explain what each of these means and how they arise. So first we're going to look at DNA, genes, chromosomes, what those words mean, because um, I know many of you are not necessarily from a biological background, and so You've heard these words, you sort of know what they mean, but I need to make sure that we're all on a level playing field before we can take them on. So DNA is, it's a long molecule that is, con or a set of long molecules contained in all cells that basically access the instructions 
um, for making cells work. You can think of um, individual genes as like recipes and and DNA is like your recipe book with lots of recipes in it. Um, so there's thousands and thousands of these recipes for individual proteins, um, these thousands of these genes, and there's multiple strands of DNA within each cell which are called chromosomes, and we inherit all of our DNA, well, all of our nuclear DNA from our parents, uh, and there's a bit of complicated stuff to do with mitochondrial replacements, but we're not talking about that today. Oh, and so in the background, there's a there's a photo of some human chromosomes. These are my chromosomes. Um, and yeah, so now that you sort of know what I'm referring to when I say chromosomes and what DNA is and things, so I'm going to talk about chromosomes as the as sort of units of um, DNA and how we inherit them and how that results in sexual characteristics later down the line. So we usually have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and I say that usually there's plenty of situations where people don't have the usual 23 pairs. Um, and of the 23 pairs, there's a pair of sex chromosomes. So the 23rd pair is the sex chromosomes, and that and there are two types of those chromosomes in humans. Um, there's the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, and typically females will have two Xs, and males will have an X and a Y. And I'll talk later about what I mean by typically, because um, there's a lot of asterisks in all of these statements, and they're going to be clarified later on. But when, first I'm explaining our binary model so that I can explain how that doesn't actually work all the time. So what's so special about this Y chromosome that, you know, why do we talk about the Y chromosome in terms of making people male, that kind of thing? So the Y chromosome is that small one there. So this is the one on the left is the X chromosome, and the one on the right is the Y chromosome. It's a lot smaller than the X chromosome, and it has on it... Um, something called the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome, which is abbreviated to SRY, and it's three letters because that's naming convention. Um, that's why it's not SDRYC. Um, and it contains all the genes, so all those recipes for protein, um, that will make um, the... the um, undifferentiated gonads become testes. So they contain um, genes that will make the gonadal tissue in the embryo become Sertoli and Leydig cells, which are what make up testes or testicles. Um, and a person can have, in the X chromosome, it has, lots of, it has lots of genes on it, but none of them are specific markers for sex, they don't make you they don't make you female. It's the Y that makes males. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and a person can have multiple X chromosomes or Y chromosomes, but the presence of at least one Y chromosome, so that means the presence of at least one SRY region will produce testes or something resembling testes in an, in an individual. So now I'm going to talk about what testes are, what ovaries are. Okay. So gonads is the word for the tissues and organ or organs that produce sex cells. So that is the testicles that produce sperm and that is ovaries that produce eggs. Um, and sperm cells are typically produced by testes and what I mean by that is some testes will not produce sperm. Um, you know, it's infertility. Egg cells are typically produced by ovaries. Again, not all ovaries are going to be producing eggs. Um, and sex cells contain half the number of chromosomes that a somatic cell, so a cell that's in the rest of the body, make. And that's so that there are two halves of a genome that become a whole genome during fertilization. 
because um, otherwise you end up with too many genes. Um, and some biologists define sex by the gametes produced. Um, different biologists will define sex um, in a way that is relevant to their specialization. So a geneticist might define it in terms of chromosomes. Uh, a, someone that studies fertility might look at it in terms of the gametes produced. Um, a, um, a behave, like an animal behavioralist will look at probably outward characteristics. So that's why we don't have a consistent definition of sex is because different biologists with different specializations will be looking at different aspects of sex. Um, so I mentioned sterility. It's not uncommon for people to be sterile, as I'm sure you're all aware, you know of people who are not able to reproduce because perhaps they have um, dysfunctional sperm or or they don't have eggs that work well, or there's more things than that that can cause infertility. But if we define sex by the ability to fertilize or be fertilized, then that means that infertile people do not have a sex, which is clearly not a good definition, because, as I'm sure you can all understand, that people who are infertile still have a sexual physiology. So clearly that doesn't work. So I'm going to move up a level now. So we've looked at gonads, what they are, so that's the testes and the ovaries and and that and now the the gonads will produce um, sex hormones. So these are generally classed as either androgens or estrogens. Androgens coming from andros, meaning man. Estrogen coming from estros, which I think is egg. I'm not. I don't speak Greek, so I don't know. Um, but androgens are things like testosterone and anti-malarian hormone, and estrogens are things like estradiol, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, and some of these are ones that you will have heard of, some of them you might not have, depending on how much you know about um, biology and human anatomy and that kind of thing, human physiology, I mean. And so these are usually produced by the gonads and also by the adrenal glands, um, which are little glands that sit above the kidneys, sort of back there. Um, and they're, so testosterone, estradiol, and progesterone are steroid hormones. And so when people say, you know, they're injecting steroids, sometimes it is actually these sex hormones, sometimes it's other corticosteroids, but they are steroid hormones, and that's to do with the structure of the carbon molecule. Um, the organic molecules that, that they're made from. And these have important roles in signaling in the body, so they'll produce certain responses in a body, but also during embryonic development and during puberty, they will um, send a lot of signals to cells telling them to grow and to form certain tissue types. So... Now we're going to talk about genitals and how genitals form. And that, during embryonic development, that is controlled by hormone levels. So genitals is the, they're the external organs and some of the internal, I suppose, depending on what you define as external, um, that are used in sexual reproduction as well as other things because obviously... Like, the people with penises need to urinate. Um, so in most cases, people will have either a vagina, vulva, labia, clitoris, set of genitals, or they'll have penis, scrotum, and that usually comes with descended testes, that is testes that are actually contained within the, in the scrotum. That's not always the case. Um, as I said, there's a lot of asterisks. 
Um, but this isn't always the case, and again, we'll talk more about this and why this arises. So genital development um, begins around week seven of embryonic development, so that's week seven after, I believe that's referring to after fertilization rather than after implantation, because depending on who you're talking to, the timelines are slightly different. Um, and genitals in both male and female um, are derived from the same tissue. So there's, um, there's this thing called the genital tubercle, and that, depending on whether there's androgens present, will go down a path towards looking like a penis and having penile-like structures, whereas if these androgens are not present, it's likely to head down the vagina vulval path. Um, and so androgens, as I've explained, are produced by the testes, which are the result of the SRY region on the Y chromosome. So you can see how there's a lot of steps involved in getting from chromosomes to genitals. Um, and so here's, here's a diagram of, um, of how that process actually occurs. So here's the, um, the undifferentiated genital tubercle, and so you can see how some of these, how these structures are somewhat analogous. You can see that the glands of the penis becomes, or, or is analogous to the clitoris, and that the shaft of the penis is um, equivalent to the, the labia minoris, and the scrotum is in fact the fused labia majoris. Um, and so I'm also sure that you can see how if there's so many steps, there's so many places for this to go in ways that are unexpected. Because um, with any complicated system, there's always going to be things that can go in different directions. And so one thing that I'm going to talk about now is how the adrenal gland can make sex hormones too. And so it means that you can produce lots of testosterone and other androgens without actually having testes. And this is quite common in something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what that basically means, though, is that people without testes, who are often um, XX, you know, have an XX set of chromosomes, can have masculinized or ambiguous genitalia. That is what would typically develop into a clitoris is enlarged and resembles somewhat of a penis while not necessarily containing all the inner tubing that would make it like, an, like a typical penis. Um, and additionally, you can have XY individuals with mutations in some of these SRY genes um, that mean that perhaps they don't have, perhaps they don't develop testes or perhaps they don't produce androgens well, so they don't produce testosterone or anti-malarian hormone, or perhaps they're not very good at receiving those signals. So they send out the signals, but no cells in the body actually recognize them. And in those cases, the, the fetus, and thus baby and thus adult, um, will be feminized or again, have ambiguous genitalia, that is, genitalia that doesn't look like a typical penis or vagina. And so then there's secondary sexual characteristics, and this is what we usually judge sex based on in day-to-day -day life. We look at someone's secondary sexual characteristics because we don't spend a lot of time looking at people's crotches. <laughs> You, you all agree with me here, right? You don't. So <clears throat> these are things that usually happen around puberty, so you'll probably have noticed that in children it's often quite hard to distinguish someone's sex from their outward appearance. 
Um, there's, there's lots of people that, you know, they're like, I can't tell if that person's kid is a boy or a girl. They've got such long hair, but they like playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you've you've seen this phenomenon, right? That that children don't look particularly distinctly male or female, despite having, despite you know, they're probably being a signifier somewhere under their clothes. Um, but then as we reach puberty and start heading towards sexual maturity, we start to develop secondary sex characteristics. And these are sort of signifiers of fertility and of sexual maturity. So these are things like breast development, lowering and expansion of the larynx, broadening of the hips and or shoulders, um, and an increase in body hair and facial hair, you know, all the classic puberty things. Um, and the development of these sex characteristics is actually the result of an increase in levels of sex hormones during puberty. So, just as um, varying levels of sex hormones will affect the way someone's genitals develop during um, embryonic development, different levels of sex hormones during puberty will affect people's secondary sexual characteristics and, to some extent, primary se sexual characteristics like genitals. Um, as people with scrotums will know. So, I said that there were a lot of asterisks, and this is where I start explaining a bit more about that. So, intersex is a word that is used to describe people who do not fit within these categories of male or female, and that is because instead of following the typical route of, you know, one step following the other producing male or one step following the other producing female, the path has diverged slightly and you end up with someone who is not, who does not display all the characteristics of a male or all of the characteristics of a female. So this can happen at any level. It can happen at a genetic level. It can happen at a gonad level, at a gamete level, at a genitals level, and at a secondary sexual characteristics level. And you can have multiple combinations of these. Um, and numbers are really hard to come by on how many intersex people are actually around uh, because we kind of tried to pretend that they didn't exist for about 100 years. Um, if you read my article in in Quilliant, you will learn all about the history of intersexuality and how the medical field kind of suppressed it a bit. <laughs> so numbers vary. I've seen ones as I've seen numbers as high as two percent. I've seen this is a, this is sort of a mid range estimate, one in two hundred people, which is still quite a lot of people. Um, it means that you've definitely been to school with intersex people, you have lectures with intersex people, um, it means that you have like, sat on a bus next to an intersex person, probably, if you catch public transport. So it's not uncommon, um, and we can't, and we can't actually ascribe a, a single sex to these people because they don't make all the check boxes for one particular category. Um, there's a reason why I've got a picture of a lion here. This is um, Mama Mori. I don't know how to say the name properly. Um, this is an intersex lion. Um, so this has been described by the media as a maimed lioness, which I don't like as a description. But this lion has been observed to <coughs> Um, behave in both male and female roles in the pride, and um, despite having a mane, they believe that there is a fairly typical 
female genital arrangement on this on this lion. Though it, it can be a bit hard to tell because lions are dangerous and it's hard to get close to them. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about. So we're starting back from the basics. We're talking about chromosomes. So people can be born with different combinations of sex chromosomes besides the XX, XY. So you can have X naught or XO. The O is, you can think of it, it's meant to be a, a, a letter O, but I like to think of it more as a numeral zero because it means that the person has one X chromosome and they don't have a pair for it. Um, you can also be XXY, XYY. You can have what's called mosaic chromosomes, so X0 and XY. So some cells have one X chromosome, some cells have an X and a Y. Or you could perhaps be XY in some cells and XXY in others. Um, and there's a few more combinations, but these are the most common and generally the most um, the most healthy. Once you start getting more chromosomes than this, um, you end up having too many copies of certain genes, and it does disrupt particular um, biological processes. Um, but these people look fairly normal and live fairly normal and healthy lives. And um, in the photo here, we actually have an example of mosaicism in a butterfly, because it's a, a really pretty example, where when this butterfly was in the two-cell stage, um, sorry, I just need to check, because they have a slightly different sex determination system. Yeah, so... The, um, the left side, so this side, is, um, has ZZ or ZO, and the other side has ZW. They have a slightly different sex um, determination system, but basically what's happened is some chromosomes have made it into one cell, and different chromosomes have made it into the other cell. And so this butterfly is split right down the middle, one half is male, one half is female. And you never get anything quite that dramatic in humans, but it's a good way of sort of explaining what's going on. One half has, one half has the female chromosome, and one half does not. So, you can also be intersex at a gonadal level. So... You can have streak gonads, which is when um, the gonads don't form into a full organ and just there's just sort of a streak of cells um, in the body. You can have things like crypt organism, which is um, when the testes don't descend into the scrotum. Um, and you can also have things like ovotestis. This in the background is actually a section of rat ovotestis. So there are both, um, these are seminiferous tubules, and that is going to be an egg cell. So you have both sperm production and egg production in this ovotestis. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are fertile, as with both sperm and egg. Um, often they'll either one or both of the gametes produced aren't actually functional. Um, and so people with this kind of intersexuality generally aren't fertile and aren't able to uh, produce offspring. And there's also hormonal. So I mentioned congenital adrenal hyperplasia earlier. So that affects, um, well, tends to affect or most notably, noticeably affects XX individuals, um, in which you see an enlarged clitoris, occasionally fused labia, to form a sort of pseudo scrotum, as it were, um, increased facial hair and body hair during and after puberty, and um, 
androgen insensitivity syndrome is sort of like the reverse of that and kind of affects, it tends to affect XY individuals or most noticeably affects XY individuals um, and can result in anything from a typical male habitus, which is someone that looks like a typical, a body that looks like a typical male body uh, to something that resembles a near typical female body. So um, I'm not sure if it goes, yeah, so it doesn't go quite to the gonadal level. So there are gonads there, there are testes that are producing testosterone, but they are, that signal, that testosterone signal being sent out is not being picked up by any of the cells in the rest of the body. And so the body just keeps on going as though these androgens aren't there. Now, these conditions do actually affect XY individuals and XX individuals as well, but it's not as obvious um, because if an XX individual has androgen insensitivity, there's not much to be insensitive to exactly. So... Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts of intersexuality for people living with it in society. So um, I'm going to use the example of 5-alpha reductase deficiency, which is um, a, it's a bit like androgen insensitivity syndrome. So what happens is the, um, the body is not able to turn testosterone into the more potent form, um, dihydro, oh, sorry, dihydroxy testosterone, um, which, and which is done by this 5-alpha reductase enzyme. So they're missing this enzyme, and they can't make this more potent form that, that enacts change in the body. Um, however, with the spike of um, hormones that happens during puberty, a lot more testosterone starts being produced. So what this means for the person is they are born and they look like what one would generally consider to be a female. And, you know, it's a girl, says the doctors. And then at puberty, they grow a penis and their shoulders broaden and they start, some people might start growing a moustache. And that has some pretty serious social implications. Um, now this isn't very common throughout the world, but it is quite common in two, in two societies that are fairly isolated. And this isolated population has meant that this um, that the genes responsible and the the um, the variants of the genes that result in 5-alpha reductase deficiency are common in those populations. So there's one um, population of people with 5-alpha reductase deficiency in Papua New Guinea, and there's another in the Dominican Republic. And they have different names for 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 these people. They have different words to describe these people, and the way their culture um, or their respective cultures respond to these changes in the people has a serious impact on their well-being. So in Papua New Guinea, um, the society, the particular society that these people are common or common in, uh, has a very strong emphasis on gender roles and sex roles, um, fertility and um, sexual prowess are very highly regarded um, and have a serious impact on people's social standing. And as a result, um, a lot of people with 5-alpha reductase deficiency in these societies get very... Um, they, they end up suffering from quite severe gender dysphoria and can have difficulty integrating in society because they recognise that themselves as not being the same as the other men. Um, and it causes quite a few causes quite a few problems for them. And then you can contrast that with the Dominican Republic and 
how they're treated within their culture and their society. So there's less emphasis on sexuality and less enforcement of these gender roles there. Which is not to say that there isn't an emphasis on sexuality and gender roles. They still exist, but they're not as strongly enforced as they are in the Papua New Guinean society. And um, they've learned to recognise five-alpha reductase in, um, in children, and um, they will generally raise them, raise the babies ambiguously as males. It's what the, um, it's what the paper I read on it said. Um, or as females, and so they're raised sort of with relatively loose gender gender roles applied to to their behaviours and their and their and how they're raised. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> and because of that slightly more or that slightly looser framework for gender there, yeah, it makes it easier for for these people to transition from their male habitus into their female habitus and and they have an easier time choosing to identify how they would like to given their quite dramatic change in sexual physiology. Um, some people choose to remain living um, as female and, and as woman in later life, others um, socially transition into a male gender role and and social role, and it's and it makes life a lot easier for them in this loose, in this slightly looser gender framework. And part of the reason why I wanted to bring this up is these are two quite clearly not New Zealand cultures. You know, this is not what New Zealand society looks like, and so we can take a view from outside to see. What would we prefer for our society? So I say that we try and be a bit more like the Dominican Republic in this case and be a bit more aware of um, intersexuality and also gender diversity because it makes life a lot easier for these people. Um, and so moving on from that, though, I'm just going to talk a little bit about medical practices that alter sex. Now, if you're in SAX 202, I'm doing a lecture that covers a lot of these in more detail. So look out for that. Um, so there's a few things that you can do, and these are all and these are all to change different aspects of people's sexual physiology. So there's hormone therapies, um, there's sterilization and or long-term contraception. Now, a lot of medical practices that alter sex are not actually specific to trans or intersex people. Um, there's mastectomies, there's vaginoplasties, metoidioplasties, and phalloplasties, which are surgeries on the genitals, or urogenital surgery is the, is the collective term for it. Dupillary procedures, which is just hair removal. Um, and there's cosmetic surgeries as well, so that's, um, that can be things like facial structure. Um, there's a few other ones that are, there are a few other surgeries that you can do as well. There's um, vocal shaving, where they actually shave off part of the larynx, which makes people's voices higher pitched. Um, that one honestly terrifies me yes. as a concept. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And has um, the unfortunate side effect, if it's not done well, of making people sound like Mickey Mouse. Um, but some people really feel the desire to do this because it's because they really need that higher, more feminine voice. Um, but yeah, one thing I do want to emphasize about this is that not yes. Oh, no, continue the, the thought that I Okay. Is that not all of these are like many of these are things that are performed by cis people, cis dyadic people. So um, sterilization and long term contraception are things often performed by cis people. Um, hair removal procedures. Who here shaves their legs? Who here shaves their faces? <laughs> like most of the room. 
Um, um, why do people get breast implants? Because they want big breasts, because they want to give off a certain image of, and their personal image of, generally, femininity. So, that's just something I wanted to talk about. My question was, yeah? um, what does, uh, oh, that's the correct now, so on the screen, um, maturityoplasty mean? Okay, because so. Obviously, um, people who aren't familiar with biometers, yeah. they'll see vaginoplasty and Okay, I get what that is. Yeah. So vaginoplasty is the is any plastic surgery to form or alter a vagina. Phalloplasty um, forms a phallus or a penile shaft. And the metoidioplasty is it's like a slightly less intense version of a phalloplasty. So a metoidioplasty is generally performed on um, people with clitorises that have enlarged due to um, or as the result of taking uh, androgens, so that's things like testosterone, um, that will actually result in enlarged clitoris and then that can be shaped to resemble a penis somewhat. However, it, you can't use it to be standing up. A phalloplasty, a, a full phalloplasty, can be used in that way, it, but it's a complicated procedure that involves extending the urethra and skin grafts and has a very high failure rate. Um, so metoidioplasties are generally the more common and safer option for people looking for um, penis or penis-like structures. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so you're right, you can extend the urethra, but it's difficult, and so generally people try to avoid doing it if possible. Because um, it's a lot easier to make a tube shorter or keep it the same length, it's very hard to make a tube longer. <laughs> yeah? Where would you uh, classify something like this erectus? Because obviously that has to do with sterilization and fertility, but it's not directly related to the gonads. Yeah, so I wouldn't describe it as a gender affirming therapy, but it is a sex altering procedure because it it alters someone's sexual characteristics, it alters someone's reproductive function. So it's not necessarily gender affirming because it's not very outward appearance. You're not going to notice that from from the outside, but it definitely does alter someone's sexual physiology. Um, so, by now you probably have wrapped your head around the idea that sex, the way we define sex is not actually very good at describing sex. Um, <laughs> and so, um, I've come up with a few different ideas for how sex could better be be described, um, but you also should come up with ways of describing it yourself, because maybe you come up with a better model than than I do and what currently exists, which is our binary model. So you could just describe sex by sexual karyotype, so that is every baby born, you check to see what sex chromosomes they have, um, or you might want to think of genitals and think of them as a bimodal distribution. So for those of you who haven't taken stats, that's this thing here. So there's two major camps, two major areas where most people fall in, but that's not always the case. Um, if you think of, um, if you think of along this axis as the length of a fellow clitoris and that up here is the number of people that have it 
here you have people that um, have a, a clitoris that is entirely contained within the clitoral hood, which is a thing that does occur. Then you've got your typical clitoral size here. Here you have the you have fellow clitorises. Here you have micro penises. Here you have the average penis size, and here you have the inconveniently large penis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you might also want to think of hormone expression as a two-dimensional spectrum. I didn't put the graph in. I made, I spent a long time putting together a graph of estradiol levels over testosterone levels, and it's not in this presentation, but it is in the SACS202 one. Or you might just want to describe it by gamete production, as those biologists did multiple slides back. So these are definitely more accurate ways of describing certain aspects of sex, but it's not a good enough definition. So here's my definition of sex coming out of all of this. And it's sex is just the combination of X and Y chromosomes, gonads, genitals, and hormones on physical and reproductive characteristics. That actually explains what sex is and not what sex does, as was in the initial description. Admittedly, it is still a short definition. It doesn't actually tell you much more, but I think it's a better one. Maybe you can come up with an even better one. Yeah, so, there we go. <laughs> now, now some questions, more slides. <laughs> Do you have so? Do you have any more questions for me? Could you put that graph on the slide, maybe? Could I put that graph on the slide? The, the oh, it's going to take lots of digging through right. folders. You don't need to do that. Okay. Yes. Uh, when you were talking about the gonads, how there are sometimes people who have both uh, can produce egg, eggs mm -hmm. and sperm cells, mm -hmm. and how they are usually not fertile. Mm -hmm. Have there been any cases of people? We don't know of any, um, unless perhaps people like the Virgin Mary. <laughs> that's, the, that's my head cannon. Um, <laughs> Virgin Mary, in fact, just selfed. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, is that, is that, is, it's not particularly helpful, but there are, there are organisms that can fertilize themselves, um, and these are referred to as hermaphrodites. We don't refer to humans as hermaphrodites, because hermaphrodites has a very specific meaning in science, and that is a creature or organism that can reproduce and that can perform more than one reproductive role, so can be impregnated and also impregnate, or produce pollen and ovum and form fruits. And can often, hermaphrodites can self, which is self-fertilize. Yes? Self-reproduction would not be good for humans um, because because we went through a genetic bottleneck relatively recently in terms of evolution and history. Um, self selfing in humans would not be good. 
we would very quickly develop extensive issues, extensive issues and all and end up with lots of monocultures and it wouldn't be good. Yeah, um, so in addition to that, I thought I'd bring up my slide on how animal sex determination is not simple. Um, so not just, so there's lots of other sex, determina sex determination systems in, um, in animals. Uh, so in some fruit flies, the X chromosome is actually the one that does this it's the one that does the sex determining. Um, there's fish that have multiple different combinations of X and Y chromosomes that actually create create their male and female. Um, platypuses have ten sex chromosomes. Why not? We don't entirely get that one yet. Monotremes are a real mystery to us. Um, yeah, mono, the, platypuses are a mystery. We don't, we don't, biologists don't even pretend to understand how they work. Um, there's also systems that aren't XY, so there's ZW um, and I, the butterfly that I showed you earlier, that employs a ZW strategy where the W is actually the sex determining chromosome. Yes? Um, how does Z differ? Is it just in the chromosomes or is uh, it the Y chromosomes? Like what's on the so, so the Z and W are used to distinguish them from X and Y system. Um, and the W is the... I believe it's the W that is the sex determining one, and that one produces a female. Um, we also have systems that are that employ haplodiploidy. Um, there are a lot of bees and wasps and ants employ haplodiploidy sex determination. So. Um, in bees, the drones, which is the the male bees, they will be um, they will have half the number of chromosomes as a as the queen and the worker bees, and so what that means is if an egg produced by the queen has not been fertilized, it will become male, and then there are more males to fertilize eggs, which become females, and so they regulate their sex ratio through how many how many chromosomes they have with it if if they can't fertilize eggs then you end up with bees that can fertilize eggs it's great <laughs> yeah we also have temperature dependent sex determination so um tuatara do this i can't remember if males are hotter or colder i can't remember how that works but there's certain genes that are that are heat or that are heat sensitive, and so when you get over a certain threshold of temperature, it switches on those genes or switches off other genes, and it results in the developing in the tuatara developing in the egg becoming either male or female, um, which is a bit of a problem if the climate is changing towards the warmer. Uh, <laughs> Smell, yeah, because it means that you're all going to have one sex. Um, this is actually becoming a problem in alligators in California, I think. Um, There's a lot of alligators. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, this is about something different, but I was just wondering how do modern day medical procedures about uh, intersex? Um, so, apparently normalization surgery is discouraged, it's not outlawed, so it's technically legal to perform normalization surgeries, which is not super cool. Um, sometimes normalization surgeries can be, 
well, normalization surgeries, as in urogenital surgeries, need to be performed because of an obstruction to a urethra. Um, because if you have a, a baby born with fused labia over the urethral opening, um, then you are going to have some troubles urinating. And so they need to fix that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs that the baby's genital configuration needs to be made male or made female, but that does sometimes happen. Um, if you want to know more about that, there's a PhD thesis written by an ex-Victoria University student um, named Geraldine Christmas. Um, the thesis has a really terrible title. It's called, <laughs> it's, called it's a dot, 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 does it matter? Um, it's a terrible title, but it's a good read. It can be found on Tewaharoa. Yeah, it can be found on Tewaharoa. So if you if you search it on the library website, you can download the entire thesis, give it a read, or just read the bits that you want to because it is two hundred pages. Mm -hmm. Or just read the title. Yeah, or just read the title and laugh about it like I did. Um, yes. Um. So I know that uh, you've been using the terms male and female throughout this mm -hmm. to describe um, statistically binary mm -hmm. um, and incorrect binary of sex mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, And then the definition would be the definition of sex that you've presented is is, in, is acknowledging that it that there are a lot of different mm -hmm. Like you know, sort of different or five different levels. Mm -hmm. um, but how would you? Uh, wow, friend light. Um, <laughs> but uh, how would you like respond to um, the idea of of using self labeling? Because obviously, it's important to know about like the different um, aspects of your own sexual physiology um, from mm -hmm. a medical standpoint. Um, but because they cannot because sex cannot be classified as male and female. Um, how would it sort of work from a biological standpoint with people um, self-labeling self their sex? So what I think needs to happen is that there needs to be a radical shift in the way we describe sex in medicine um, and how doctors write out people's medical records um, because currently it's there is one tick box um, that is supposed to include someone's sex and gender, which causes problems um, because it means that any if the record gets shared with a different doctor from your usual doctor, they may not necessarily consider that the that despite there being an F written on your <coughs> on your patient record that you have a prostate and need a prostate checkup, mm -hmm. um, or and it do also doesn't account for people who are intersex because you actually can't put them on the box, and it also doesn't account for people who have undergone a sex altering procedure. So. If you try to check the hormone levels of um, of someone who's received a hysterectomy and you know, or had their gonads removed or anything um, like an orchiectomy, it's probably going to ask something like, "What day of your cycle are you on?" The medical record, like the medical computer systems and things often will actually ask things like what day of the what day of the cycle someone's on even if they're not menstruating um, I once saw an example of the clinical details said amenorrhea and then it asked what day of their cycle w was on which is ridiculous because they're not bleeding how are they supposed to know there is no cycle so yeah currently our medical system and our administrative things going on in medicine are very unnuanced. They don't allow, they don't consider that people are complicated, bodies are complicated. They try to 
put it into it into two little tick boxes. Bingo. Yeah, and so in that sense, like, I mean, I, I sort of think that if people are like asking about your sex, if, like medical professionals are asking about your sex, then they should, you know, have different, different lots of different boxes for the different things that they like. So, you know, what is the sex you're going at? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, in that sense, how would you react to like the idea that if you can't categorize sex as these two things, then then you you know you can't say that a a, that a, a trans man's sex is female because he is male and that not for these. Something that's yeah, so I, this is, this is sometimes a controversial opinion, I don't like the use of male and female as gendered terms, um, because of the confusion it causes, because masculine, feminine, man, woman function quite well as gender terms, and in my mind at least. That's how I conceive of those words, and I can have to consider male and female as um, biological or physiological words, um, partly because that's just how my training as someone in biology, that's how my training has been, mm. that those are the words that are used. Um, and yeah, obviously I do it the other way around, and I go, okay, I don't use these as, as biological terms, and I just, just and I talk mm. about the the different the different sex characteristics, yeah, as aspects of sex. But then I would say, since I am not binary, my sex is not binary. But then these are the different right. boxes that I fall into. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I see so what I, you mean. I and use those just as gender terms and not as sex terms. So. It's, this is what I want as a tick box. I want each of these to have a tick box. <laughs> but this is a long way off. Um, I'm sort of fighting from the inside. <laughs> um, yes? At the same time, um, as much as people might resist the thought, at the same time it will produce better quality care for all people. It will produce so better just... quality care for all people. You're absolutely right. Fight from the inside. Fight from the inside. Turn yeah. the walls. Put it from Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Um, hi. I want these articles on Papua New Guinea and the Dominican Republic. He's written to me. Um, okay. Also, um, when discussing things with people who do not understand how sex actually works, one thing that they like to trot out is that um, intersex people are infertile, so they don't count as a valid like point in the fact that male and female aren't as rigidly polar and defined as they would like to think. Um, so what actually are the rates of infertility in intersex people and how would you deal with those arguments? So the rates of infertility are quite high in, in, in intersex people um, because if there's issues with genes that makes it hard for gamete production to result in um, gametes that have the right number of chromosomes and that work properly. Um, again, gonads, if you have something like streak gonads, um, they're not producing any any gametes at all. Um, gametes, well, it's, it's obvious, we've already talked about that, genitals. If you don't have a genital config configuration that actually allows for carrying or you know internal sexual anatomy that allows for carrying a, a fetus to term or impregnating someone um, then that also can make someone infertile but there's probably just as many infertile people who are not classed as intersex that the, the, as there are intersex people who are infertile. So, and a, another thing to note is that depending on your definition of intersex, not all intersex people are infertile. Some people, and this is this is up for debate um, among 
intersex advocates and researchers and things, some people class PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, as an intersex condition um, because of the way it impacts gonads and the secondary sexual characteristics. However, people with PCOS can and do get pregnant. Um, and so they're not infertile. Sometimes they often they'll have reduced fertility, but they're not 100% sterile, cannot produce any offspring. And that's, that is also true for many other intersex conditions as well, that there is reduced fertility, but not complete sterility. Some, of, some people will be completely sterile, some people won't. This, the fertility of intersex people is on a spectrum as well. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> the answer is almost always, it's complicated. <laughs> yes? Oh. Uh, yes? I actually wanted to ask about polycystic ovary syndrome, the other one is blind cell syndrome. Mm -hmm. Because they both result in mixed sex characteristics, but they're not statistically counted as intersex conditions. What does determine if something is counted as intersex conditions? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. See, that's the thing. We don't have, as I've explained, we don't have a proper definition of what binary sex is. So naturally, we don't have a definition for what intersex is, because if you don't know, because intersex, the inter meaning between sexes, if you don't know what the sexes are, you don't know what's between them. <laughs> <laughs> is there a reason why is because of that? Particular? Sometimes they are counted. Depends, depends whose work you're looking at. It's the thing, like, I count Kleinfelters as an intersex condition, and I'm inclined to think of polycystic ovarian syndrome as intersex as well. I, I have a pretty fast and loose approach to how things work. Gender-affirming therapies, I believe, are for cis and trans people and intersex people, and I believe that intersex conditions are... There, there's a spectrum from being like an intersex condition to being that there's you can be that there's a spectrum from intersex to dyadic and there's it's it's complicated. Yes, any any more? Should we? Oh yes, I just want to say that I think that the binomial um, distribution mod distribution model is actually creates a very good idea. Oh yeah, and I like it. <laughs> if you continue into um, postgraduate um, studies and pursue this as a field of study and of influence in terms of creating a more open model of uh, mm -hmm. like this is how sex works, guys. Well, let's think of this. Um, that would be a fantastic way to. Because yeah. people people look at definitions and they go, ah, uh, and they look at a graph and they go, ah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like my bimodal distribution and model. It's, 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 a, it's a spectrum as well. It's not, mm. it's not just a. Yeah, but it's 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 clearly a spectral. But you can see that there's definitely yeah, two I mean, major two, camps that yeah. people fall into. Yes. I think Pardon. Dyadic. Oh, sorry. So dyadic is a word used to mean not intersex. Die. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Although it seems to come from a different origin than yeah, because I. Depending on what source you're looking at, sometimes it's spelt with a Y, as in dyads, as in like. D Y A D. Sometimes you see it as di as in D I A D. Very concrete field of study. Yes, yes, very concrete field of study. Um, yeah, feel free to come up and talk to me. I suppose we're going to wrap it up now because questions are dying out. Take resources. I'm going to turn off the recording.